Hey guys, Stephanie here with the Aeroponic Tower channel. Welcome to the garage where we're growing the majority of our own produce throughout the winter. This garage is kind of going through a transition, so I'm going to show you guys around and give you a tour and show you everything that's growing December 26, 2024. I also want to share a new toy with you that is very, very helpful for maintaining the cleanliness of your towers when indoors and we're going to troubleshoot some things. I like to kind of walk you guys through real life situations when you're growing your own food indoors so that if you're having the same situation you can see how I troubleshoot things to find the answer and figure out what's going on to equip you to have better success growing indoors. So these towers have been indoors for about a month some of them. I don't have all my winter gardening set up. I'm still waiting on pepper seeds to germinate and some other things uh, but things are doing good and moving forward I have decided not to transition all my towers outdoors and then bring them all back in because it's put some huge gaps in our food. I don't have tomatoes I can harvest right now. Pretty close, but still, you know, probably 30 days away from having our first tomato. I don't have peppers. I don't have eggplant. I don't have squash or cucumbers. All of those things had to start over when we moved into the garage, which just puts this big gap on our food availability. So moving forward, instead of growing all the towers outside for eight months and four months indoors, I'm going to keep a couple of them indoors full time. That is a great way to make sure you have access to a variety of different food year round. So in season, I can grow all our tomatoes for the year. So much food outside. If you guys watch my past videos, I mean, these towers just produce an abundance for our family in season. And I'm able to extend those seasons because there is a tolerance plants have when you're growing them on the tower versus in the soil. So we get to extend those growing seasons by growing a little bit earlier and later in the season outdoors. But in the dead of the summer, I'm not going to be able to get bok choy and lettuce and a lot of those greens that we like to eat when it's super hot outside. So by keeping towers in here full time in the summer, I'll be able to grow cool weather crops that I can't grow outside like cilantro as well. And then in the winter, I won't have this gap where I'm now starting over. I'll be able to in October, make sure I have our tomatoes ripening at that phase and on a good interval process so I can be eating tomatoes and cucumbers and all those things right now because it's definitely sad when we don't have access to those grocery store prices are through the roof we're up in the mountains so they are double through the roof this time of year and it's just important that we kind of fill that gap so i'm going to show you how i'm going to set up this garage to make that possible and grow food both indoors and outdoors year-round moving forward. It'll also help me to make year-round content growing indoors, which I think is very valuable information to know if we're trying to replace the grocery store. So a couple of things came in the mail that I'm gonna show you, and we're just gonna take a tour of the towers, and I'm gonna show you some problems I had and how I figured out what was wrong, just in case you have the same situation when you're growing. Okay, so first things first, this is a garage. It's, it was actually a diesel mechanics garage, so the ceilings are really, really high, which means it doesn't hold heat down here very well. I do have a heater in here. We were using, during COVID, we were using this garage as office space. So we do have a mini split system, but that's not necessary to have. We also have these little small space heaters that you can buy at Walmart or Amazon. I'll link some below, the ones we have, that we used to keep in our camper basement when we were living in our camper and it would keep the floors from freezing. And those work as well. You can just put them near your towers and put heat on the towers that way. And that works, especially if you're in more of a, like a basement or a traditional garage. This one's just kind of massive. So I do use the mini split system when we're in here. We also use this gym for working out and a lot of different things too. It's sort of a bonus space for our family. So it's important that it stays warm because we spend a lot of time in here actually. The other trick, if you're going to grow in a garage, and these are not things you need if you're growing indoors. A lot of people just have a tower in their kitchen or their dining room. I know some people who've converted their guest bedrooms to have many towers so they can grow their food throughout the winter and year round. Uh, this. So this is for 
if you're trying to get warmth in your towers and you don't have like a controlled heating system. So I am going to use these fish tank pumps and I will put links to this as well. Actually, there's a link to my stand store and all of the descriptions of my videos and then all of these products are listed on there as well just to keep the links active so if the links go bad I can update them easily. So this is a water tank heater. So what I've noticed is that even though it's warm in here, because the temperatures at night get really, really cold, it is cooling down enough. And then when these run like a fountain, you can hear them. That's a trick like we used to use in Florida to cool our pool. We would turn on a fountain pump and the water gets exposed to the cool air at night and it cools off the whole pool. That's happening in here. And so when I put my hand in the tank, they're really cold. And too cold for some of my plants, things like peppers and eggplants and tomatoes really need more warmth than the water is right now. I would say the water's at like 55 degrees and I wanna get that up to more of the 65, 70 range. So I'm not gonna put these in all my tanks because a lot of my produce is cabbages, greens, lettuce, all of those things actually like cooler weather. And so it's fine for those, but for the peppers and the squash and the cucumbers and the things that I really want to thrive and produce quickly, I'm gonna put the I'm gonna put these heaters in. Decided to go with, um, and I have other ones of these, but these I just got a couple of more. This one that tells you the gauge, so you can tell the temperature. And I went up wattage, so I if it said for 10 to 20 gallon tank. These are 20 gallon tanks. I went up to the 20 to 30 gallon tank to give it a little bit more power. And then you can control the temperature on these, which is great. This one has a range of 63 to 94. I'm going for that 65 to 75 uh, degree water. So we'll see how that does. I'll keep you guys posted as I get these all set up. Okay, first things first. We're gonna go take a tour. I got a couple of problems here. And I wanna address each of those in case you have the same problem or you notice this going on with your food, you can kind of troubleshoot the same way I am. First thing I'm noticing, I have a cabbage that looks like it has powdery mildew, which is so strange to me. I've never had powdery mildew on a cabbage. So I don't know for sure if that's what's going on, but I'm going to treat it as if it's powdery mildew. So my formula is to take a 16 ounce water bottle and you wanna add about a tablespoon of dish soap, which is already done in here. And then I'm going to take pH plus. And I've done this with pH negative two. Both of them work, but I like the pH plus better. Um, basically all we're doing is spraying the leaf surface and the powdery mildew does not like to, first off, it doesn't like to live in an acidic environment, but even lowering the pH, which is what this is going to do, kills it because it doesn't also like to have a changing pH either. So we're just throwing it out of balance and it goes away. Powdery mildew is very common in this kind of environment. I have a lot of moisture and humidity in here because it's not sealed. I'm going to put two capfuls and I'm just going to eyeball that. And this is our pH plus. I'll put a link to this below. And that's all we're gonna do. And then I just lightly spray it. If I have powdery mildew, I will just make sure I check on this every couple of days. And if I see that it's still there tomorrow or the next day, I'll do another dose until it's under control. I tried to do a weekly, very light, not heavy, misting on the things that are prone to powdery mildew, just as a preventative. And I'll show you guys that as well. We're gonna spray some of those things today. You guys can't see behind you because I'm reorganizing, we're kind of in the everything is a hot mess phase before it gets better and organized. Okay, and I'm just gonna hold the camera and do a whole tour of this tower and some of these, um, and then we'll back it back up and I'll show you guys some other things I wanted to mention. So I've got my towers cleaned in the back. Those will be filled soon. I'm just waiting on my starts. And it's kind of a mess on the bottom, so don't judge because we're cleaning everything up and reorganizing but here is my cabbage and that looks like powdery mildew so we definitely don't want that so we're gonna do is spray it do a heavy dose of this 
on both the front and the back side. And that's it. All right, and so now that one's covered. And let's just take a tour of this tower. So I've got some new starts ready to go in. This is dinosaur kale down here. We've got some red Russian kale. And if you see leaves like this, that is nothing to worry about. It just was broken. Most of the time when you're having problems, it's like the leaf got bent somewhere and is just spoiled a little. There is some spotting on some of these leaves that is due to being outside and then transitioning indoors. This is a blue veil kale. So it's got a bluish tint to it. Absolutely gorgeous. We have our parsley doing really well. Jijimusai. And I like to just come and take off any of these bad leaves and look for any problems that might be going on with my plants. This is celery, Chijimusai. As we go up the tower, this has a Baby Greens extension kit on it. This is Mizuna. And some of these are brown and it's because they had frostbite from outside and then they were moved in. So we just take those bad ones off and I'm gonna let this keep growing. I have a gorgeous beet. Uh, more beets over here. Uh, purple Merlot Napa cabbage up there and my camera doesn't always like to focus in on some of this stuff there we go gorgeous and we we'll kind of repeat throughout here this is Napa cabbage down there here we have a cucumber cucumber is prone to powdery mildew and since I have it so close that cabbage is just right here I'm just gonna give this a quick preventative spray and then we need to talk about what to expect with cucumbers indoors. So let's finish our tour and then let's dive into understanding the cucumber plant when growing indoors. Here is purple cabbage. These I seeded for per rockwell, so they grow as big purple leaves. I have a fennel bulb here. More kale. It's gonna be dark on the side of the tower. Here's a really sad looking cucumber. And again, we'll talk about why in just a moment. This right here is celery, and I talk about how I grow my celery all together until it gets to a certain age, and then I separate them. So we're about ready to separate. Going up the tower, we have more Napa cabbage, lots of parsley. Mazunas, look at this gorgeous beet here. Just lots of greens. Okay, I have lights above my head. I can't wait to reorganize this garage. It's gonna make it so much easier to film with better lighting. But down here, I have a zucchini plant. And up here, I have a cucumber. Cu cucumber definitely has some powdery mildew on it. So I'm gonna spray both of these a good hefty amount as a preventative and to manage any spots it already has. Just kind of go underneath the leaves. When you're growing cucumbers and squash indoors, there's this weird thing that happens. And I totally forgot about it until I started growing indoors again, because I haven't grown indoors for eight months. But they come out and they're kind of crunchy. The leaves get really crunchy, they get a little brown and yellow, and the instinct is to want to pull it and start over, but it seems for me, and it could have something to do with the varying temperatures in this garage. It might not be an issue for those of you who have more of a controlled environment in a home. I don't know because I don't grow in our home, but in here it they start off that way and they go through this weird phase where they're kind of crispy and crunchy and then all of a sudden they start to produce really healthy looking leaves it's almost like the plant just needs time to adjust and those first leaves those first true leaves that come out after the plant sprouts are just not thriving leaves and then the new leaves come out and it grows pretty quickly it grows pretty slow going from Putting it in the tower and those crunchy leaves just kind of staying there. They're growing, but it's really slow. But then all of a sudden, new leaves come out and they grow really quickly. 
So that's what's going on with those. I don't worry about it. I can't tell you why it's like that, but we have to understand we're trying to grow food outside of growing conditions, outside of the seasons in artificial light, and it's not going to be 100% perfect because we are growing outside of the season. Now, I will tell you, even growing cucumbers in the soil, you can have all kinds of issues and some you can plant. I've planted 20 cucumber plants and had two come up and do amazing and the rest die. And some years I've had them all have issues and some years they've all thrived. So some plants are just a little bit more difficult and finicky. So for me, it's just like accepting it's got crunchy leaves. Let's see what happens. And it, they do tend to correct themselves. I'm working on possibly keeping them in the nursery way longer and letting them get some significant root structure before going into the tower to see if that helps. I'll keep you guys posted. But that's all that's going on. My advice is power through it and it should be fine. Okay, so we, we talked through this tower Lots of greens on the baby greens extensions, basically beets, mizunas, mustards, tajimusai, celery, bok choy, kales, cauliflower, uh, here's um, not cauliflower, cucumber, and here is one that the new leaves did come out. These are soft and healthy. These don't have that crunchiness I was just talking about, but the original ones did. They're still down here. They were crunchy and weird, so just give them time. All right, this side of the tower, there's just going to be a lot of repeating things. We've got beets taking off, green onions. Check these out. Cute little radish coming in. Some onion. Onion's going to take a really long time. Here is some of my Melissa. And it's coming back. I cut it back completely. And you can see there's a little new life growing. Just a nice full tower with quite a bit of diversity. Onions, greens, kales, herbs, so many things. My camera is having focus issues. Until I get this garage done, I can't do a real thorough tour and go through every plant. But my leeks are growing back. I share how I cut them and they regrow. So we've got peppers. I cut all of these back from outside. Okay, so here's a pepper plant. I don't know if you guys can see that because my camera doesn't want to cooperate today, but it's already blooming. So it came back really well. Um, there's lots of that Merlot cabbage. More leeks growing back. This is my larger stinging nettle plant. I just harvested a ton off of that recently. Gorgeous beets. Um, uh, more Merlot cabbage towards the back here. We have arugula and gorgeous lettuce more arugula okay and this right here is my micro dwarf tomato this is a hanging basket variety so you can see how so you can see how it creates this like drooping effect here um, like it making making an ideal for a hanging basket some of it's growing up some of it's dangling down it's a great option for indoor growing to get cherry tomatoes okay so this tower right here is so pretty this one I started from scratch and this is what sold me on not transitioning things but we do have a problem and you guys might be able to spot it this is my tomato tower and it is a collection of micro dwarf tomatoes with greens that grow fast in between them that I can turn over quickly. So that's endive. There's some cabbage kale. Kale that's very similar to cabbage. We have our peas down here and I have these worked in in several spots. This is the little tom bee. I did two seeds per ruffle, three on a couple of them. And those are doing really well and starting to produce fruit. So that's exciting. This is a curly kale from my gardener. Absolutely love it. I'll link that below with the discount. His seeds are so affordable. So definitely check those out. This is a mustard. These are growing super quick. This is a mustard variety that matures really quickly, which means it'll go to flower. You can eat the flowers and you can harvest these quickly. So I don't have to wait months and months. This is five weeks. There's another one. 
up here and I'm actually going to be harvesting this and juicing it. We've got some endive up there, some absolutely gorgeous tomato plants. Okay, so what you may have noticed, some of these leaves are curled and very sad looking. And I noticed about four days ago that this was starting to happen. And so I started doing what I always do and just thinking and troubleshooting through what it could be. And this is a sign of stress. It's not the end of the world. It just tells me there is something going on. If this happens outside while you're gardening, it can be exposure to a toxic chemical like somebody's um, somebody's weed killer spraying into your garden. It can be a sign of too much water. Um, it can be a whole bunch of different things. We don't always know and we can't always figure it out when we're growing outdoors, but because we're growing inside, it can only be so many things. So I started to think through, is it a pH problem? Now, you will hear me say a lot on this channel, I don't stress about my pH. I actually have not checked the pH of these towers since putting them in here and adding water. I don't have any need to, everything looks really healthy and I'm familiar with my water and so I know when I add nutrients to the right proportions, they're fine. I don't really have to worry about that. But I did have this curly kale that was getting some yellowing on it. And so I was wondering what is going on because there is some yellowing and yellow plants, a lettuce that is yellow, a lettuce that's yellow, the whole thing's gonna be yellow. It may have different shades of green in it, but overall it's just going to be yellow. But when we start to get yellowing, and I don't know if my camera's not focusing well today, but if you start to get yellowing, but you see deep dark green in the vines of the leaf, that can tell you there's a problem with your nutrients or there's something going on. That's typically the red flag for me for checking the pH when I start to see that. I have seen that on a couple of these. So I checked my pH, my pH was totally fine. So then I started to wonder if I didn't have enough nutrients in the tank. Um, this would tell me there's too many, this droopiness but this was giving me signs that maybe there's not enough. And so I decided to add a little bit of nutrients. Kind of made this worse. This is the only leaf that's like this. So the plant, it wasn't spreading. The problem with this one, it was not spreading quickly. If your nutrients, like if you forgot to put in the A and you only put in the B, or if you get super diluted, it'll start to change or your pH is really, really off. It won't just change one leaf to a lime green with vining. It will change multiple really quickly and it'll happen really fast to a lot of the leafy greens really quickly. And that wasn't happening. So then I thought maybe I should add water to the tank since this got worse. And then it dawned on me, this is a sign of too much water. Maybe my tower isn't set for the I for indoor growing and somehow I got switched to the O for outdoor growing. And that's what happened. We actually had a powder a power outage now that I think about it. And when they came back on, it just was set. It defaults back to the O for outdoors. And I just totally forgot to switch it over. You didn't even think about it. So that's what was going on. So we want to just kind of go through the process of elimination. They were getting way too much water. So they're not now. I'm not super worried about it. Um, I'll just keep watching them and we'll hopefully see a cure to that. It's probably gonna take a week for that plant to get healthy and balance back out if it was too much water. If it doesn't fix and it continues to decline, then I'll have to go through this process again and try and figure out what is the mystery. But I really think it's gonna be fine. The other issue is that these are cold to the touch. It's warm in here, but I can touch my tomato stems and they actually feel cold. And that tells me that the tank water, because these are aeroponics, they're getting lots of water, they're holding onto their water very, um, you know, this is a water dense plant. It has a lot of water in it. That tells me the tank water's too cold and that actually might be a part of the problem as well. They were definitely getting too much water being set to the zero for outside, but it could also be that the tank water is too cold and they're not super happy about that. So I'm gonna switch that heater onto this one. Mm. And dive is so fun. So delicious. 
Mm. I really wanted to kind of zoom in on a lot of these plants, but my camera's not cooperating today, so stay tuned. I'll give you guys a full tour once I figure out my camera issues. But really today, I wanted to show you some troubleshooting things in case you have the same issue and show you my new toy. So I was doing an online teaching course with a friend in Canada who's translating it into French to help some of her tower gardening customers. We're talking about how you deal with aphids. I have aphids in this garage. You will see ladybugs around. I release ladybugs in here to deal with them. Deals with about 80%. Uh, does a great job. The ladybugs are amazing. Not always an option inside your home, although in our home we actually have ladybugs that live, they hibernate and are out. I'll go put them, I take a paintbrush and kind of collect them. They hang out in the windows and I'll take a paintbrush and collect them and then bring them out here. So you may already have them in your home if you live in the region I live in. I was sharing with her that I had an air blower. And so aphids go through a different phase. The final phase is they have wings. That's how they get to your plants. And aphid does not crawl in that tiny little state that we see it in on our plants to your plants. It goes through the whole cycle and it's the flying ones that start the ones that are on your plants. So I have found a lot of times because they can live in such tight places in your plant that I would take one of those blowers to clean, clean your keyboard and I would blow my plants off to clean them. And then I would just wipe the base and sweep the floor. So part of my cleanup with my towers is that. And so I manage aphids by checking my plants. I check my plants every day because I love it. It's not the end of the world if I go three or four days, but any more than four, you can start to really let an aphid problem get out of control. So what I do is I just walk around and look at my plants. I'm looking underneath them. I know which plants they like, and I'm just gonna check out all of the plants. I never suggest starting over because if you have aphids you're probably always going to have aphids because they're not coming from your plants unless you bought plants from somebody in a greenhouse that had them they're coming from other foods in your home they're coming from pets can bring them in from outside if it's the flying versions that spread they can fly in when the doors open and come through tiny screens they're there. If you have them, you have them. The reason they get out of control in a home is because they can spread by six every 24 hours, and that's a lot. And there's no pest. So when they're outdoors, I don't have any problems with my aphids in, with aphids in season growing outdoors because the predators are there and they keep them under control. So we just have to mimic that same environment if you have them in your home. Not everybody gets them. Uh, to me, it's just if you have them, just not worrying about it, but staying on top of it is the key. So this was accidental because I bought this to be a blower like I've used before to blast off my computer keyboard. I've used that to go in and blast in my plants because it'll blow aphids off. And like I mentioned before, they're not gonna, that tiny little aphid is not gonna crawl back up your tower. It could, but it would take a while. But what I do is blow them off from the top down so that as they fall on other plants, I can get them off of those. And then I just wipe down the base if anything fell on the base and it just keeps my plants nice and clean of any pests. So I wanted to order a new blower and when I ordered it, I accidentally ordered this, which is not a blower. This is actually really cool. And I will have a link to this below. It's a vacuum and a blower. So one side has this vacuum with um, a filter in it and you just stick it oh, stick it on like that and it's got a nice brush this is really good for larger leaves so some of my cabbages some of my leaves that are larger it has a nice suction and it's just brush and it's just kind of brushing those leaves clean so I did that on this tomato plant actually that had a few aphids on the leaves and it did a great job. But there's a really cool part that I like. The aphids, when you're dealing with something like this Napa cabbage here, the problem with aphids is they will go into these tiny little creases and start to multiply in there. And so you can end up with more than you like of the aphids, uh, one or two on my plant. If I see them on the leaves, I just wipe them off. But if they get in those cracks and multiply, then you can get a lot of aphids quickly. So came with this little part. 
and it goes on here and it doesn't run through a filter or anything it just kind of goes right into the motor but these are like microscopic little bugs so it doesn't seem to matter and it's a tiny little vacuum and that tip does an amazing job cleaning the inside so even if i don't see them what i've been doing as part of my tower maintenance is coming over and cleaning where i know if it's like to hide and just freshening things up and i just find it very therapeutic it's freezing outside and wet but i can be in here in a short sleeve shirt and be warm and it just and just enjoy starting new seeds and caring for my plants and harvesting things and dreaming up the foods i'm going to make and coming up with creative ideas to grow more food and maximize it so this is just part of the to me the fun process of spending time with my plants and gardening this is gardening you know very different than soil gardening and i don't miss soil gardening i will tell you that but this one blows you put it on the other end so this was the end for vacuum and then if you put it on this side it does the opposite and it's pretty powerful and it's great because you can just go like this look at this gorgeous celery i just can't get over the abundance these towers provide the key interval planting if you're not familiar with interval interval planting make sure to download my free ebook uh, there's an ultimate guide to tower gardening as well that gets into all the nitty gritty. The free ebook version just talks about why these towers work so well, why we should be growing our own food, kind of the basic overview of what you can grow. If you want to get the specifics on how to care for each individual plant and how many seeds to plant and the temperatures they need to grow and some of my favorite recipes for eating these plants, make sure to check out my ultimate tower garden guide for that. And happy gardening, guys this is incredible it's cold it's winter and i have celery that'll be ready in just a few weeks to start eating off of and provide so much abundance and health for our family